here we are for the final closing keynote. Yeah, let me just uh, quickly introduce Francisco to start with. I think uh, most of you met Francisco on the day one, uh, but if you've not, uh, Francisco is the uh, founder and uh, CTO for Airline Solution. Uh, I've known him for a few years. He's been an awesome supporter of this conference and in general functional programming. And, and of course, all the awesome work he's doing, he and his team is doing on the beam. So it's an honor to have him back uh, and continue to support this conference. So thank you, Francisco, for being with us on a Saturday afternoon from London. Uh, thank you. We actually have people from three different continents now on this particular <laughs> uh, thing. And uh, then we have Bruce. Uh, if you can just uh, unmute yourself for a second, Bruce, and say hell, hello, so people can see you. Hi, everybody from Florida. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Yeah. And so Bruce, at least uh, I've known him again for a few years, uh, been a very big inspiration uh, and big influencer in the programming world. Uh, I first read uh, his bitter Java book long, long back <laughs> and uh, been a fan of him since. Uh, so finally, someone spoke the truth <laughs> kind of a thing. Uh, and uh, of course, his seven languages in seven weeks, that was uh, amazing as well. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know how many of you uh, were there in the 2019 conference. Uh, Bruce did uh, a fantastic keynote uh, at, at the 2019. It was uh, titled Joy. Uh, you know, basically, it, it, it was everything to do with uh, Bruce's experience of how uh, he kind of got back into uh, experiencing the real passion of programming and maintaining that passion. A uh, lot of uh, wisdom in, in that talk. So if you've missed that, I'll, I'll put that on, on the chat here for folks who want to view it later. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that Bruce, you're back uh, with us this year. Uh, and so without much delay, I think I want to hand it over to both of you uh, to to uh, take us through this exciting topic. So, well, thank you, Naresh, so much for having us. Uh, you know, thank you for putting us such a great conference and really rallying the functional programming communities in Asia. So Bruce and I, um, last November, I think it was, uh, both keynoted at Elixir Brazil. I, I think one of the things, you know, with the pandemic is that, you know, whilst we might be apart, these virtual conferences actually have actually brought us together. And... Throughout this conference, uh, Bruce had the opening keynote at the conference. And you know, throughout the conference, there was a theme emerging. Um, other speakers, you know, me included, started referencing Bruce's talk. Uh, we were referencing his talk out of admiration for what he was doing, out of concern, uh, but also because it was full of parallels and anecdotes, which we ended up using in our respective talks. You know, I found myself you know, late that you know, night before you know, having to present mine, rewriting my talk you know, to fit in you know, items from Bruce's talk. So um, when the opportunity showed up, uh, we decided to join forces. And so, you know, despite you know, the pandemic actually easing up, it had to be a virtual conference. Um, we couldn't have done it otherwise for reasons you know, we will now explain. So. Bruce, when, when we last spoke, I was actually in London, uh, but I'm now back in Rome. And I was a bit concerned when we were kind of sinking, uh, preparing this keynote, because you had a really, really bad connection. You know, that got me worried. The problem <laughs> seems to be gone now. Where are you? <laughs> so I'm in the Palm Coast. And, and um, so the bad connection was Marina Wi-Fi. And um, I'm actually on a boat. So we took some pictures this morning. Uh, let's see. So this is our boat called currently, and we're kind of jammed between these um, these two pilings. And so yesterday we got in and we tried to um, to back the boat in so that we could get off easily. And the wind was so bad that we had to pull straight in. And then we kind of turned around and it's a beautiful little marina with uh, with some with just lots of the the water is glassy smooth this morning there's a lot of beautiful boats and it's a lovely temperature outside um there are birds tweeting and and you know fish playing and we've even had some dolphins um pretty close to here and so 
we're there because we are taking a trip. I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and these pictures are taken way over here um, in New Smyrna. Actually, we're just north of that now in Palm Coast. We thought that we'd be in New Smyrna for the talk, but we've moved up that green line north just a little bit because we are taking this cruise called the Great Loop. And I don't know if you know it, but more people have climbed Mount Everest <laughs> every year than, than have completed the Great Loop. It's an audacious undertaking, but it's fairly low risk. Like nobody's ever died. Um, in, you know, there's been a few people embarrassed, but, you know, nobody has ever um, gotten in, in, um, in over their heads because for most of this trip, we're within sight of land. So, right. So, I mean, that, that's fairly close to Cape Canaveral, as I get it. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful coastline. I've taken a similar route, you know, but by car, not by boat. Uh, and my, my favorite town, by the way, on route, just to take notes, uh, I hope you'll be able to visit is St. Augustine. Uh, we spoke at Elixir Days there. But um, what is the Great Loop? Uh, you know, can you tell us a bit more about it? Yeah. So, starting with our, our journey, um, I walked downstairs one day and um, the non-adventure person in our marriage is, is Maggie. And um, it was 2020 and we were feeling what everybody else was feeling at the time. Um, we were, you know, I had come through some medical issues. There was the pandemic, there were professional issues. Um, Maggie had many of the same and we felt like we were drowning. So she read this book called From What Is to What If, and I had seen this trip in the past called The Great Loop, which is, which is a, um, a nautical trip that we'll talk more about in a second. But Maggie started to wonder, what would quarantine look like if you were able to control the circumstance? From what is to what if, she started imagining, and she started reading this book unbeknownst to me, right? So I walked downstairs and I said, hey, Maggie, what's she reading? <laughs> and she flashes this book, The Great Loop Experience. And I don't think I said anything for a full minute. I think that my mouth just hung open because this is on Maggie like to, to really start to plan something this adventurous and this audacious when we've got jobs, we've got kids, when we've got a house. And um, so we started planning this and, and um, you know, we started thinking about four years out and then two years out. And then some of our best friends said, if you're really serious about this, you should drop everything and go. You should drop everything and go. You should dream. You should get out here. And so this is what the Great Loop looks like. If you, if you see Tennessee, so that's um, maybe right about in the middle. Um, we are in the, the lower right corner. That's the southeast corner of Tennessee um, near that angled line in Chattanooga. And we're on the Tennessee River. So if you follow that line that looks like a V down to the southwest and then across, that's going to put you here where the loop starts. And then you take the longest man-made canal in the United States called the Ten Tom Waterway and some Alabama rivers to get down to the Gulf of Mexico. You sail across to what's called the Big Bend of Florida. And then you do what's called dun, 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 the crossing because the blue line on top there gets too shallow for most boats, and it's a little bit too treacherous to do alone. So most people take a long trip across. The only time that we're out of sight of shore, we're about 70 miles offshore, but we go, we do the what's called the crossing, and we, we come into a town called Tarpon Springs. We actually went a little bit down to Clearwater. And then you go down around the tip of Florida and the Keys and Miami. You come up the coast all the way through Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, near, near Norfolk, Virginia. You go up near Washington, D.C. into the Chesapeake Bay. You come out and then around New Jersey to New York. 
and then up into to Canada into the Canadian Great Lakes through this beautiful waterway called the Trent Severn Waterway. And then you come out at Chicago after going through Lake Michigan. And then you go down the Illinois, Ohio, and Mississippi rivers. And then we turn back to the Tennessee and we're home. And so Maggie and I said, we're going to take the dog. We're going to do the trip. We're going to buy a boat. And so we were imagining what if our circumstances were different? What boat would we like to live on? And we said we'd kind of like a tiny house on water. And that's effectively what we got to do the Great Loop. We got this little boat that we're calling currently, right? Because currently is kind of now what's happening in our lives right now. And this is what the boat looks like now, though when we saw it the first time, it was on land and it, it was, you know, the paint is shiny and everything, but it wasn't in the best of shape, but we loved her immediately anyway. Uh, I mean, it was love at first sight. We, we knew that we were going to put in an offer. We, we came in planning to haggle and we said, no, we're going to pay you the full price. <laughs> and um, so we got this boat, we whipped it into shape. And um, to, to whip it into shape, we had to, to ship this across land. And so this big fort lift came and, and made noises with our boat that no boat should ever have to suffer. And I was sad and currently was sad. And then they dropped the boat onto the trailer and the trailer and the boat together made these loud, angry noises. And I was terrified and Maggie was terrified. I think I cried. And so eventually the boat showed up unscathed in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And they took this big lift, they put it in the water and then we drove the boat home. Sounds amazing. Um, is it as easy as you originally thought? <laughs> yeah, so you asked that question already knowing the answer. Maybe to embarrass your friend. Famous words, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's this little cove. When, so when they put this thing in the water, there's a little dock behind you. And what you can't see is that this is a cove surrounded on all sides. And there's this little dock. So if you're looking at this picture, or if you're nautical off the starboard side, if you're looking at this picture, it's off to your left, there's a dock. And you see that little dock with a pole on it. Well, so we were pointing right at, right back at land. And we had to make this fairly technical maneuver on this boat that we'd never driven before. In fact, we'd only driven these tiny little pontoon boats, which is like a floating couch on water. And so we pulled out from the dock. This is the first five minutes, not even on our trip yet, getting ready for the trip. Our first five minutes, we pulled out from the dock and I immediately noticed that the throttle and the rudder were much more touchy than I imagined. And that I couldn't really tell where my rudder was facing until I was going fast in some direction. And my, my really kind of, I don't know, I don't know the best way to say it, um, excitable wife. So she started talking calmly and I knew that that's when I was in trouble. And she said, Hey, Bruce, you're going to hit the dock. You're going to hit the dock. You're going to hit the dock. And indeed, the dock was attracted to my boat and my boat was attracted to the dock and they got together and they kissed lightly. <laughs> and, and we left a little lipstick and the dock left a little lipstick and everything was okay. <laughs> and then we started pulling away from the dock, picking up speed and out of control. And Maggie said, you're going to hit the boat. You're going to hit the yacht. You're going to hit the expensive yacht. You're going to hit the five million dollar yacht. <laughs> and finally, just inches from control, you know, right after my wife says, "If you don't turn to the right, you're going to take out the five million dollar yacht." I finally remembered to turn into the obstacle, goose the throttle a little bit to kick the back end around, and then nudge it into into forward, and we were off. So no. Nothing about this trip has been easy. 
But, you know, why are we talking about the loop? You know, I kind of, I see a metaphor coming here, Bruce. Yes, yes. So I believe that loops are in the heart of programming. And loops are also in the heart of human experience. Indeed, when we want to eat somewhere, we typically go back to somewhere we've gone before. When we're learning something new, we go back to it and practice it again and again. Programmers and people understand loops. It's a great metaphor. In fact, my first program that I've ever wrote was a loop. This is a basic program. 10, print Bruce, go to go to 10, right? And then I would add spaces to it to make it slant off to one direction and then the other as, as I ran it. And I even turned this little program into a game where instead of Bruce, I was writing these angle brackets that looked like UFOs. And I kind of moved them back and forth and and uh, yeah, so so my first program was all over this. So I mean, th this is a function of programming after all. You know, not one on sailing or <laughs> basic. Even though, yeah, that that was probably my first uh, program as well, which I wrote in my Commodore B twenty. But you know, go going back to the loop. I mean, you start in Chattanooga, you finish in Chattanooga, and. You know, who knows? It, you maybe have enjoyed it so much that you'll want to start all over again, and then you know, sail the loop again and again. Um, it, it's uh, it sounds like a tail recursive function to me. Uh, you know, basically a function you know which can call itself you know without adding a frame on the call stack. So you know, it's tail recursive functions which allow us to create loops which can run forever without stack overflows. Uh, we go in and we pair them up with another key attribute of functional programming, you know, that of immutability, you know, where a process or, or, or a function for that matter is the only construct allowed to change its state. So together with processes, immutability and tail recursive functions, we get the building blocks, which we use in both Erlang and Elixir. And we use these building blocks to actually break down our problem into many smaller manageable problems and this manageable problem is what we call an otp loop uh, where we abstract away from tail recursive functions we break up the loop into many smaller handles so we've already taken our problem and broken it up into many smaller processes we now take a process and break it up into many smaller handlers solving an inbound event at a time so i, I think it's very similar to what you're doing with your trip Bruce. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, this is this is really something that somebody else has designed. <laughs> and and we're not thinking about that giant loop. We're we're taking this loop, uh, breaking it into many small side trips that, that you could think of as each one is a transformation, right? So yeah, I like I like that metaphor. Yeah. So you know, an OTP loop will take an external event. So in our world, in the Erling Legacy world, it's a message. Uh, it will have a loop state, which is basically Brooks and Maggie and their moods on the boat. And it passes it on to a custom handler, which deals with it. Um, you know, I will be referencing, you know, generic servers moving forward. But, you know, this concept will apply to all OTP behaviors, be it a finance state machine, event handlers, tax agents, or, you know, or even supervisors. They all build on the same concept of a generic server. It's the pattern you're know, behind all patterns. A generic yeah, yeah. server, you know, no, sorry, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so exactly. And and you could think of you could think of the loop in this in this form where we've we've got these, we've got the old state, and that's that's how we were before. We go to this new place, we accumulate these new memories, and then we are somebody different. And you know, a gen server will go in and wait in a receive evaluate loop. When it receives a message, it extracts it from the mailbox, invokes a handler, and passes it on, you know, to the current uh, gen server state and message. And you usually, you know, go in and create a custom handler for every request type, uh, and you forward it to the gen server as an OTP message. Uh, the handler deals with the message, returns a new state. The handler is the only place where the gen server state is changed. You're triggered by the messages it receives, and you know, of course, you know, along the side, you know, the state change. The handler executes all of the necessary computations needed to deal with that message. And you know, these computations might result in side effects, such as sending messages to other behaviors, or you know, Bruce you know, joining us for this conference, or sending off postcards or emails. 
updating things to a database. So as you know, as, as he's working along, he updates things to Groxio or just plain IO. You know, uh, he could send out radio messages. You know, the goal, as we know in virtual program, is to try to limit side effects and retain as many of the state changes as possible within the process. You're, you're basically trying to isolate as much as possible. Now. We promised, you know, alongside the basic, this is the only other code snippet that we'll show you. You know, this is a keynote after all. And Bruce put together this example, but when I saw it, it, it immediately reminded me of uh, Tim Bray at Oscon. I think the year was 2008. He went in, uh, it was the open source conference, and he showed very similar code, which was in Erlang, but with code which did very a very similar thing. And I was so blown away by what he said, I had to write it down. And he, yeah, he said, you know, after you've opened the top of your head, reached in and turned your brain inside out, this just looking like a natural way to, to count integers. And Erlang does require some fairly serious mental readjustment. But if somebody came to me and wanted to pay a lot of money you know, to build a large scale message handling system that really had to be up all of the time, could never afford to go down for years at a time, I would unhesitantly use Erlang to build it in. Now, this mental you know, readjustment is all about thinking functionally. Uh, it is all about abstractions. And in fact, it's about a more natural way of doing things than what you might be used to. And it's a way of doing things taken from functional programming and the functional program paradigms. You know, the hard thing here is not, you know, as, as, uh, as Tim describes, you know, taking your brain and turning it inside out. The hard thing here is unlearning what the other programming uh, paradigms that have taught you. It's, it's uh, you know, the hard part is not embracing the Erlang and Elixir way of doing things. And, you know, that comes natural. I mean, Bruce, you know, uh, how does all of this look like to you? Yeah, I think, I think you've got it exactly right. I think that the point is that this is a transformation interface, right? So we have the, we have the count and all the user needs to provide is this function, this count plus one, right? So, and on the river, we see something that looks very much like that. We don't, we don't have to build all of the inf infrastructure um, of the river, it's already there. What, what the infrastructure needs to be added to make a river, a river that's deep, navigable, is a transformation interface. So I know that that sounded confusing. Let's, let's make it a little bit more um, concrete, right? So think to a movie called The Jungle Cruise, where you have this iconic scene of this boat going over a waterfall, right? And the problem is that the level of the river on the upstream side does not match the interface of the river on the downstream side. The levels are different. So if I try to sail a river like this, proud currently comes up to the upstream side, comes to the tip of the waterfall, flows over the waterfall, and then bad things happen. So instead, what we do is we use an interface. And in this case, the interface is a transformation and the hardware that we're going to use the to do the transformation is a lock. So we take currently, no syncing here, float currently conveniently to a full chamber full of water with doors on the top and doors on the bottom. And then we close the doors and then we drain the water out of this isolated chamber. And then currently can sail off into the sunset. And this is what it looks like in practice. So this is a lock that we're pulling into. This boat in front of you is a tow called the Bearcat. And we're not going to be the only two boats in the lock. In fact, this is the second time that we've gone through a lock with our boat. And we were terrified because we'd only ever gone through only ever gone through this lock at once. But we pulled in, tied up to this bollard. And this bollard is another interface, right? It's rather than tying up to the side of the lock, which would be bad, right? It would keep you in the same place, which you don't want, right? It would keep you in the same place on the wall. And then you drain the water out and you have a boat hanging on the wall. But instead, you have this interface that neatly slides up and down and floats on the top of the water, but stays in a track. And this does keep the boats in, in place. 
and then other boats come in and tie off and there's still other bo boats on the left hand side in this picture. And then after you dry, drain all the water out, all the boats sail out and move on down the river after we've used our transformation interface. Oh, this sounds great. It's, it's fascinating, but you know, let, let, let's get real here. It, it's not all about sailing. We all have day jobs. Uh, how do you get your day job done on the boat cruise? Yeah, so, so effectively, we're, we look for times to, um, to sneak in work um, between all the other things that are happening. And, and um, so effectively, we're looking for three or four hours that we could really hit hard. Um, and in fact, Maggie is across from me working diligently on editing some Groxio videos right now as we speak. And so there are other tasks to do that kind of mix around. But effectively, when I'm creating content, I'm using, um, I'm taking this content, it builds these big videos. And so I need to have access to good internet most of the time. So I create this content. And then I upload it to the internet through this system. Uh, so the antenna is called a pointing antenna, which is seven individual um, antennas under the triangular cover on the upper left. And those connect, four of those connect to two different cellular providers. Two of those connect to a Wi-Fi gateway and one is a GPS signal so that we could tell where we are. And that connects to this system called a PEP wave. And the PEP wave, if you see on the bottom left, there are two cellular SIM cards. And so that we could use two cellular providers and stitch together the best possible signal between the two. Now, most of the time this works. Like now we have brilliant internet and we're in this small town um, called uh, Palm, Palm Shores, uh, Palm Coast, <laughs> and um, and but sometimes, probably three times so far, we haven't had any internet at all. <laughs> no internet, just alligators. Well, so that what, what that does is it makes you eventually consistent, which I guess is is not an issue at all for you. Um, you you do, do not need asset properties. You do not need transactions. You do not need strong consistency for what you're doing, um, and, yeah, and and that the same applies to a lot of the systems I design. Uh, eventual consistency is enough for your use case, and and you need to build your software around it. I mean, what I take is important for you is that you are continuously able to develop new material for Groxio, which you then upload. But if there's a delay in uploading it, your users, users won't probably notice. You know, they won't notice there's latency. And you know that they will you know get get the new content you know once you're out of the alligator swamp is that right? Yeah, yeah. So um, and you can see that in some of the other things that we do on on board. So we'll get to the power in a second. But um, but we're going to have to be maintaining our engines, right? And um, you know in this case there are ten different pumps on board. And those pumps move, move fluid from one place to another. This particular system moves fluid out of this shower bilge um, and, and into what's called the sump of the boat. And, um, and so I had to, there was a, a float switch that was broken here. In this case, there's a, um, here's my engine. And um, as you can see, there's a little bit of redundancy baked in here. Yep, I, I see two oil filters, and, and that's so true. I think yeah, yeah, two, two fuel filters cards. too. Yeah, yeah, yep. you had two SIM cards. You know, you need two of absolutely everything, you know, to avoid single points of failure. I mean, you need a Bruce and you need a Maggie as well, you know. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. The the two oil filters give us redundancy. But. I actually just saw one belt in the engine. Uh, what if the belt breaks? Is that not right. a single point of failure? You know, uh, do, do you right. have sails as well? Do you have oars <laughs> you and Maggie can take and use? Yeah, yeah, we do have some systems that I'd like to talk about. So we don't have perfect redundancy um, in the sense that you're used to thinking about it in um, like in the Erlang sense. 
but there are other systems that that we do that do give us some redundancies um but none of it's perfect for example here i am replacing the batteries on the boat there's six different batteries but they all go bad at the same time right um and so in order to combat that there are different power systems on the boat if we're at the shore we could wire to shore power we have a generator on board we have a solar panel on board um, but still, if you are starting the boat, the batteries have to work. At least one of the batteries has to work, and it has to be one that I can connect to the engine. So that's not perfect. No. So uh, you did say earlier you, you will be sailing, you know, past one of my favorite cities, New York City. And I think when you're there, uh, you have to pay a visit uh, to the AT&T Long Lines building. It's just south of the Bowery. Uh, it, it, and it's my favorite example, which always reminds me that single points of failure are not just in the software. Uh, you need redundant power supplies. Um, and you know, the long lines building was used to house telephony switches. Um, less so these days because they don't take up that much space, but telephony switches may never fail. Uh, you have to be able to make calls, even in case of a power outage. And the Long Lines building has a fuel tank in the basement large enough to store enough uh, gas uh, to power up generators and keeps the keep the phone switches running for two weeks in case there's a back uh, there's a blackout in Lower Manhattan. So you know, and, and you've said it. You know, you've got multiple batteries, you've got solar panels, you have you have wind turbines as well on the boat. Yeah, yeah. So, but what we have isn't isn't perfect right it's it's uh so we don't have a um we we can lose all of our batteries at once and though we have different power systems we can get failure so yes uh, i mean i see there is only one boat and <laughs> you know failure happens when you least expect it you know what if an iceberg uh you know makes it all the way down to the florida coast um <laughs> you know what happens then well, then we're looking at bigger problems, but yeah, yeah, the, your, your point is taken. Um, so we have these things called not not um, icebergs, but crab pots, right? And so a crab pot is an industrial um, lobster trap. And if you hit one, it wraps around your propeller. Um, and sometimes the lines are strong enough to pull that propeller axle right out of your boat and sink you. So we have systems for thinking about um, how to make things a little bit more redundant. So one of the ways is that when we are not confident about something, then we're always running with a buddy boat. So you saw this picture of us coming out of the locks. Well, um, that's that ship right there is a um, is a tug. I think it's an American tug or a Nordic tug. Um, and you know, we ran um, down to Chattanooga with, with that buddy boat. But there's also this crossing, and that's a little bit more extreme because at that point, we're out of sight of land. So we need to think about more about that system. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So this is um, where we're trying to cross cut across the big band of Florida. And you might think that it would be better to follow the shoreline closely, but it turns out that, that those waters are treacherous because they're shallow and because the sand moves around. So we get what we call shoaling. So it's relatively easy to run aground. And if you run aground and the tide goes out, then you're landing on the side, then, um, then you're letting water into places that it's not supposed to go. You're letting fuel and oil out of places that it's not supposed to go. And it can be a bad situation. So instead of, of following the land, we go out to sea for the only night on the loop. And so we've thought a lot about this particular day because it's different than the other days on the loop. So here's where we're looking for, here's a little video that shows us looking for what's called red two, which is a red buoy with a number two on it. You can see that Maggie's driving here. I'm helping to navigate. Um, she's picking it up and you can see the navigation charts. You can see that long line at the bottom and th that line is kind of pointing to the crossing. And there's red two. 
And then on the other side, there's a red four at Tarpon Springs and we're going into the channel there. So we were driving across, we brought a friend with us for a little bit more scalability, right? And so what are we trying to scale? Well, the hours that we can sleep. So with Sam aboard, we can sleep for two hours on for every hour that we drive. And then so eventually, so we start this relatively late into the day because we want to go overnight. So eventually the sun sets, um, there's, a, there's a picture of the mast in the middle of the night. This is what our running lights look like, which they're red, so they, prefer, they preserve our eyesight. And you typically have them on like in this lock on the Tennessee River, but we typically have them on when um, we haven't had enough coffee, right? And um, so here's a picture of an, the iPhone um, saying that we are in the middle of the, the Florida coast, and eventually we're going to get to the other side. But we have to be careful. So the redundancy that we have is that little red boat that's on top. It's pretty small. It's only 12 feet long. And in this case, it takes 700 pounds, which is just about enough for the three passengers and the dog. Um, obviously, we'd have to take the seats out, but we have a little bit of a motor that can, um, that, can get us, um, that can get us to a point where we can radio for help. So did the three of you do the crossing alone? Is it safe? You know, I was following you on Twitter and I was very concerned. <laughs> right, right. So we did cross alone in this case, and we have systems for dealing with that too. So the first one is that we file a float plan. And this is something that we can use to, um, you know, to notify the Coast Guard that we're, we're leaving somewhere. And we tell people that we trust that we are we are leaving and if they don't hear back from us to notify the coast guard and this is what a float plan looks like we talk about our boat we talk about the equipment that we have on board we talk about the passengers on board um, who's who are the captains um, what level of experience they have and then along the way we collect information about the trip so there's an there's a a person that um, that we knew about that wound up doing the crossing, and they had this brand new boat with all these new electronics, and they turned everything on full blast just because they could, and they cooked their alternator, which meant that one by one these systems started to go dark, and one of the things that went dark was the navigation system that told them where they were and the radar for seeing other boats in the middle of the night with the sharks and the alligators, and they're away from land. And they called the Coast Guard because they had a battery backup. And they said, we're a vessel in distress. And the Coast Guard said, where are you? And the boat said, I'm in the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know where. <laughs> and that's not enough information, right? It, this this one worked out okay. Um, but what we do is every every hour we write down our position and the time and um, and the distance from um, from shore. So so that the Coast Guard can can find us if we have problems. So yeah, I mean, you you basically what we call uh, an append-only log. <laughs> that's great, Bruce, and yeah, and that's when it comes useful, you know, for troubleshooting. I mean, all of this uh, sounds kind of like the error handling we're used to in the airline ecosystem. Um, we go in and we try to isolate failures in layers, you know, a bit like the layers in an onion. Uh, if you cannot solve an issue in a particular layer, you escalate to the next layer. So you know, you first try to fix the problems on the boat. If that doesn't work, you jump into the rubber dinghy. If, if the rubber dinghy is not enough, uh, you try to go over to your buddy boat. And if the issue is there, uh, you put on a life vest and call the Coast Guard. Is that right? That's right. I'm getting it. Yes. It, it's great to see how you're using your airline experience you know, in, <laughs> in the loop here. Now, just like you know, we have generic server loops uh, with custom handlers, supervisors will do exactly the same. You know, they have handlers which are there you know, to deal with failure. So you know, you've got your supervisor, it runs in a receive evaluate loop, and its only task is to go in and monitor 
other gen servers. So other or well, uh, all any other OTP uh, process behaviors. And it can send a message you know, to the gen server instructing it to terminate, or it can also receive an exit signal for the gen server, allowing it to react upon the termination. And you know, the supervisor, you know, when it receives the exit signals, it handles it in a special handler who's, and what this handler does is it goes in and restarts the server. So everything which was functioning in the server is safe and it allows uh, the server you know, to continue executing from, you know, even right before the failure. So I, I guess Bruce, it's, it's a bit like your insurance company of you know, being very quick in, you know, in, in paying out if you do crash the boat and supplying you with a brand new boat so you can actually go in and complete your trip. But I, I, I trust you know, that there are also limits in your insurance as to how many times you know, it will give you a new boat and restart it. Um, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, I don't know if you've seen it, but I'm wearing my you know, Keep Calm and Let It Crash t-shirt today. I, I'm, I'm wondering, have you printed <laughs> your you know, Keep Calm and Let It Sink one? <laughs> Not yet, but we have to have a, a Keep Calm and Let It Sink <laughs> uh, shirts. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's start a thing here at Elixir at, at um, Functional Conf um, India, yeah. That's right, yeah. Now, you, you know I love how, you, you know I love to cook. Uh, you know, you've been to my house many <laughs> times. We've had, we've shared many good wines and many good meals. Uh, do, do you need a cooking board? I mean, the uh, reason come on. is I'd love to sail and, yeah, and be part of the loop, maybe flip a few burgers and make a few plates of pasta. Uh, yeah, I, I, come on, come on, we'll take you. So our, our success, my family. Our, uh, you know, well, package. sort of. So we can, <laughs> yeah, we've got room for six. So we 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 okay. don't grow beyond that, you know. And and um, you know, it has to be oh. the right six. And you guys definitely qualify. But um, but yeah. So six oh. during a daytime run, but overnight, no, we can't do that. So you'll need a second boat, uh, and you'll need the second boat not only for full tolerance. You know, but also for scalability purposes, you know, could we maybe, you know, we'll leave the kids with you and Maggie and then Alison and I can go into the other boat. Or, you know, I, I'm sensing another problem here. What if we want to invite Leslie Lamport along? You will need at least three boats if he needs to join. So right. How do we solve that? Yeah, so there's a, there's a number of, of systems um, for, for solving that. And most of them involve either getting a larger boat, which comes with its own trade-offs, right? Um, or um, providing vertically, yeah, 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 or um, or multiple boats, and and we see many families doing the loop together, um, and that's that's all always possible. And so those are our, our two scaling models. I mean, usually, yeah, scaling horizontally yeah, with multiple boats, you know, tends to be the cheapest. Uh, tends yeah, to be the cheapest of, of it. Yeah, Ten, so, tends to be the cheapest. Yeah, yeah. yeah so this is. An amazing adventure. And the programmers get it, right? So we start somewhere. Each iteration is a stop on the trip. And it transforms us. Sometimes in ways that we expect. Sometimes in very unexpected ways. Sometimes we're in isolation. And sometimes concurrently. So we watch. And we wait. Until we're back in the same place. Home again. And transformed in exactly the right way. Thanks for thank leading you, us through this. <laughs> yes. and thank you, Naresh. Awesome. All right. I think uh, there's lots of comments and uh, I think we should uh, turn over and uh, take some questions now. Uh, there's an amazing and an inspiring story, Bruce, uh, here. Uh, you, you probably are now going to be inspiring a whole generation of programmers <laughs> going on their own version of adventure whatever that is so yeah thank you and that's that. yeah and that's what it's all about right it's it's um maybe 
so for us it's a loop we had a we had a um, house close to a river i grew up in a river town um but i hope this does inspire other people to reimagine the circumstance so maggie had the um was sad because we were in quarantine and we were letting life happen to us and she reimagined what happens if we reshape our quarantine um and that that started this this whole adventure um and we've just kind of cracked the surface so i hope that you'll take the chance to reimagine your circumstance i mean we've come out of you know two very hard years but i think a lot of what we need to think about is what are the positives which have come out of these two years and you know Naresh, as i said earlier you know i myself have just moved to rome to italy you know and it's the pandemic which has enabled remote working and enabled us to do it and and make our customers realize that you know we can help them as well remotely as yeah as we did on site and uh virtual conferences you said today you had people you know from three different continents coming in and and listening in um you know that would have been really really hard you know before the pandemic so uh i think you know let's embrace the positives which have come out of it and let's keep on building on them absolutely i think one of the most inspiring thing i heard uh, during the pandemic was you know uh, someone drawing a metaphor of what we are going through is kind of birthing and on the other side uh, is something much more beautiful waiting for us and so if you keep that perspective uh, it, it can actually really uh, help you focus on the positives and being opportunistic of what you could do uh, given the circumstances uh, and Bruce is like a living legend for that, uh, showing, leading the way. And I'm sure that would be, you know, something all of us draw inspiration for. So again, uh, thanks both of you for uh, doing this, uh, Francisco and uh, Bruce. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are questions, uh, folks, if you can leave that in the Q&A section. Uh, we will unmute you uh, so that you would be able to uh, ask your question directly and uh, maybe we'll take 10 minutes uh, for questions. I'm sure uh, people have uh, someone earlier commented that I have hundreds of questions, uh, so we won't be able to take 100, but <laughs> a few for sure. So we, we've got uh, Brian. Hi, Brian. Great to see you. Um, you're Cardarella and he's got a question. Brian, can you unmute yourself and ask it in person? Uh, Brian, if you can uh, just uh, lift your hand, raise your hand, I will uh, unmute you. There we go. Yeah, Brian, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to speak now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hey, Bruce. So uh, none of my questions are technically related. Actually, kind of is. So I guess the first question, uh, I, I'll limit, I won't do hundreds of questions. I'll limit to maybe three. Um, so as a uh, voter myself, I'm curious to know Bruce's perspective on this, is how does he uh, feel about the state of the art of boat instruments and the technology available to put onto boats? So I, I assume that you're talking a little bit about AIS? Well, that, that was the question I put in there. That was what I was going to get to. I'm more interested okay. in just the general instrumentation. I assume you have Raymarine or... Um, one of the other brands on board. Yeah. So, so what we do. Um, so, I, I believe that um, that what's happening in boat in, in boat electronics is the same thing that's happening in car electronics. That um, that you have a you have a new car and it works great, and then two years down the line, um, it doesn't work so great anymore because there's you know eight more state-of-the-art systems that have been delivered or all the maps that you bought have been updated and they're not um, they're not current anymore. Um, so what we tend to do is we use the, the big electronics package right there. Can, can you see that? So yeah, that's our, um, yeah, that's, that's old, um, that's old Garmin system. <clears throat> and then um, on the top of that, if you, if you see, there's like an iPad with, um, you know, all the fingerprints all over it. <laughs> and yeah, we use that for with with Navionics. And I think that that's a, a pretty common way 
um, for people to well, address it? it? Yeah, that's, that's what I, we I do. I think that's my point is that everyone ends up using their iPad or iPhone because uh, yes. both instruments suck. <laughs> They're terrible. Yes, yes, it, yes. It feels, they like do. You're, it feels like you're taking a step back 10 years. Like on my, on my boat, I press and they all try to be modern by the sense of giving you these like nice flashy UIs, but they yes. never bothered to upgrade the actual hardware inside to support that. And so when you, when you press on a screen, like you'll notice sometimes a two second lag when it's paginating over. And this whole industry is like ripe for massive disruption. Um, I agree. It's uh, it it is so underwhelming and it is so overpriced. Like the, the instruments that Bruce has on board, Mm -hmm. like if you were to get a equivalent, like in terms of hardware horsepower and then functionality in a non-boat setting you're probably talking about maybe hundreds of dollars but that equipment right there is thousands if not tens of thousands of dollars it, it is a complete joke and i as twelve thousand that dollars. is yeah exactly twelve thousand so dollars for upgrade the, the, yeah so, ryan isn't it just the same in the automotive industry though it's exactly the same exactly the and same. i'm looking for a new car right now i'm actually yeah. looking for a car which uh, will allow me uh, to display my iPhone screen on the display in the car because yeah, yeah by the time you, you 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 get your car the software on it is already outdated. It's it's well so there are res- there are limitations that have to occur in boating at least. So the the um, the equipment has to be hardened for waterproofing to a certain extent. It has to be hardened for UV exposure to a certain extent. It has to be hardened for just humidity exposure to a certain extent. And what this does to the casing is that you really lack airflow. And so you can't have CPUs that are gonna be overtaxed to the point where they're gonna require cooling, like direct cooling in any way. And so this in part, I don't wanna discount the greediness of these companies because that's a huge component of it as well. But in part, I can't speak for automotive, but at least on boating, this is in part why the, the hard, the the, the electronics feel so stunted in their um, like in their progress, but there's, there's just so much to be like, Bruce, I'm sure that you're, you've at this point now have become aware of your fuel consumption. Cause that is like the, the, the number one focus of boaters is you, you get out there and you're like, you start living the life, but then you realize like, wow, I'm just burning through diesel, like so much of it. Right. And, and the, the tools don't really exist to help you, optimize your cord. They do on like large container vessels, um, but not in the recreational watercraft space. And so one thing that um, I've always wanted to do, and I'm really happy to see that, you know, this is the the foundation of allowing for this in Erlang Elixir starting to happen. But a lot of the effort around NX are tools and uh, 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 libraries that I'm hoping to repurpose at some point in order to enable me to build out better uh, functionality for boating. And a lot of this is predicated that boating at its base just becomes like a series of vectors and vectors yep. translate very, very well over to tensors. And so yep. a lot of that work, imagine if, if on your chart, right, you say, I want to go from to from where I currently am to this destination and the charts are where the depth. So, you know, if you have a system that's smart enough, it should be able to give you a navigable course, but if it also optimized for your fuel consumption, Like these are things that should be part of it. It shouldn't take you 10, 20 years, 10,000 hours offshore in order to accumulate that knowledge. Because there's so many recreational watercraft uh, owners that are never going to get to that point. And they're just wasting so much fuel when it comes to like just going out for the day. Not to say that we all need to just like go on that optimized path because sometimes it's more fun to meander around. But at the same time, like I, I... like based upon everything else you said, Bruce, I have to assume that you're very diligent about your fuel consumption and ensuring that you know, you're being um, uh, you're 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 being as efficient in that regard as possible. But it it is a that's a whole like profession into itself and learning how to yeah. optimize for it. Because you have to start looking at currents, you have to start looking at wind. So if you're dealing with headwind at a certain time of day, do you then decide to delay your your current leg by twelve hours or go over? Yeah. So what so we did. So we took a different approach. <laughs> we took, so rather than, so most, the, the standard loop boat is about um, 38 feet and has about a 12 foot beam or a 14 foot beam. Mm. Um, and that's, that's because people want to take their, um, their American living rooms onto the water. 
and that's yeah. not what we decided to do. What we did was was we 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 um, we decided to squeeze the boat, make it skinnier. Um, we decided to um, to make the boat lighter, um, and we didn't compromise on features. And that put us in a boat called a Ranger Tug. So we don't really worry too much about burn. Um, we worry about our burn instantaneously, right? Um, and we could see our instant consumption. And that's, and then basically, so we track that and then we track like um, a couple of times a week or, or, um, or monthly or something like that. We look at our overall diesel consumption and decide how that compares against our budget. Do we need to drive it up or down um, right. and between those things? But, but what <clears throat> Brian is saying is, is exactly right. It's that we have this, this idea that, um, that there's, there's tide. So water coming in, water going out there's um there's the the shape of your hull um and then the power and the efficiency of of the engine and then to a lesser extent when and all these things come into do um and come into play when um when you're processing efficiency um and we could be a lot better at that with the horsepower that we're throwing at the electronics than we are and is ripe for disruption i'd like to move on to the next question if there is one or Brian, if you have one. I, I have one, Bruce. Bruce. Okay, okay. I, I've got a question for you, Francesco? Bruce. What's, come, what, what's next up for Groxio? What is it, you know, you said Maggie was working on some, uh, you know, was editing some, some videos whilst you were giving your talk. What, yeah. what, what's next? So right now we are working through um, through Lifebook. So we, we um, our last full um, module was Index, which is machine learning, which is exactly what, um, what Brian was talking about, that the idea that you could have a generic program and you could train it to solve specific problems. And, and the program, the input for the program is a tensor, which is just a bunch of, um, that's it's, it's a multi-dimensional array. I mean, th um, that's really what I love about, you know, the, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting here, but it, it's um, what I love about the way, you know, the industry is heading towards, you know, because as I said in my opening keynote at Codebeam, you know, we have, you know, take uh, the work which is happening with NX, Axion on top of that, embed it in NURBS. What you're doing is you're actually moving the compute to the data. So, you know, you'll start running uh, your, your, your machine learning algorithms in the boat itself, localizing them. Yeah. Um, you know, add, you know, faster hardware, you know, add, you know, your access to, to better GPUs, multiple GPUs alongside you know, the work which has been done with the JIT compiler, I think yeah, it's really is opening up for a lot of opportunities, yeah. Yeah, but as, as so one of the things that happened is, is that um, the way that we consume data science and, and models like, um, like for example, um, you know, a, a like, like the, a fuel consumption model that, that Brian might produce, the way that we consume that is not the way that you consume a particular chunk of data or a particular program. It's more, we'd, we'd, we'd like to see like a top to bottom narrative of the experiments that we're running. Um, and so to do that, there's a, there's a, um, a program, or I guess a little bit of a framework called Lifebook, which is, um, which is an interactive mixture of code, code output and prose. Um, and all of the tooling that's around that, um, and Elixir's version also adds a distributed element of that to make it interactive. So Groxio is talking about Livebook, and really we're focusing on scenarios and um, and tools to make that happen. The scenarios that we're covering right now, um, I did some collaboration with with my co-author for building a binary clock with Elixir and Nerves. Um, that's Frank Hunleth, the creator of the Nerves framework. So. I, I talk a little bit about our collaboration and how that worked, um, and and that's the the video that Maggie is working on right now. Okay, so I I, I can take another share. Um, Aditya, you know, there is a question which uh, if you could raise your hand and I will I happily I, answer yeah, it. it yeah. I was uh, curious about fault tolerance in the context of uh, like maritime communication, for example, where either. Um, in normal situations, your uh, bit rates might be slow, but uh, many times, um, I mean, the boat might have to be completely in, uh, radio silent or uh, let's say a submarine is uh, down like for a month or so or something like that, right? Um, so 
uh, like a Erlang beam style system would probably be fault tolerant for maybe minutes or maybe an hour no. uh, hour scale outage. But like, how does it behave in case of like so much uh, asynchronicity or disruption in communication? Like, uh, what are the properties of so that system? Curious. We we we've been building systems like that for decades, uh, as you just described. I mean, uh, network outages are rarer today, but you know they can last days. Network outages can last weeks, and and despite these network outages happening, you still need to be able to function. Uh, so uh, you know this is something you need to build into your business logic from day one. So you cannot go in and design a system, and then you know halfway through the designing, you're going and add a feature. Okay, but the system also needs to work uh, offline. Uh, it needs to continue function offline. It's something you need to you, you need to start doing in from day one. And just to give you an example, I mean, we had one switch where, you know, partial failure meant that you couldn't do any long distance calls, but all your local calls were still being served. And then they, they, they kept on being served. Um, but long distance calls couldn't be happen, you know, couldn't happen because uh, someone had cut the cable. So it, it, it just very much, you know, depends on, on, you know, the type of problem you're trying to solve. And, you know, you, you added in a follow-up question that, you know, telephony case by contrast would be fairly soft real time where, you know, down can be a few minutes maybe. But yeah, again, that's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, it, it just, Sometimes, yeah, you do develop systems which could be down for, you know, f for a few minutes after which you get into trouble. So, you know, that could be a, a bank system, for example, where you know, there's only so much money you, know, you might want to allow people to, to take out of the bank accounts you know, before they start hitting their overdrafts. Right. And so, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll yeah, add I guess another, the, like the cash machine system is basically like that. I guess every cash machine has some sort of a... A rate limit of uh, money on it uh, because if it loses connectivity with the bank, it should still be able to dispense some cash, but not. It will. Uh, correct. It will. It, still, it, it is. Spend and things like that, right? Cash systems are not synchronous, unlike popular beliefs. They're asynchronous, and you know, and they lead to eventual consistency. And they've actually done it where you know, they've gone in into two separate cash machines and extracted money at exactly the same time, and uh, you know, with not enough money on the account, uh, the account went overdrawn. Uh, that, that, that is how these systems are built. And it's all about trade-offs. It's all about trade-offs between consistency, availability, and reliability. And you know, depending on where you want to be in that quadrant, uh, you, you need to base your design decisions and your trade-offs on that. So, and sorry, I mean, even, Bruce, if you had, go, yeah. even if you go into Elixir and the, the Phoenix framework, um, the the channel presence is is built with exactly these trade-offs in mind is that that there are independent consistent uh, independent systems and they're each locally consistent and they're eventually consistent um, with the whole system it doesn't matter how long you're offline i mean I, I'll, I'll just i'll just quote joe armstrong here you know airline you know you fire off a message but you've got no guarantees that the receiver will receive that message so you basically you send and pray, uh, and you pray that the end user receives that message, but you don't know if it does. Uh, you know, on a virtual within a virtual machine, yes, yeah, it will it will receive it. But if you're in a distributed system, you don't know if it will receive it, and that this lack of reception is what you need to deal with in your program itself. So you, that's where you're lifting that full tolerance. Yeah. I'm also curious, like, uh, like the pathological cases, uh, uh, the two, uh, like, or whatever, the network is in communicado for a long time, and then there's suddenly a lot of stuff to send across, uh, and then there's like this uh, uh, crazy amounts of chatter which sort of saturates the network potentially, or uh, like those, like, I suppose those are pathological cases yeah. where uh, you need to reconcile the state of two, it, like, heavily diverse correct. systems, right? It completely depends on the format, uh, uh, it completely depends on your use case. And you need to design around your use case. You need to design your system around your use case. It's not something you can bolt on as an afterthought. So uh, if there are requirements that your system has to be offline for weeks, then you need to test it and you know, make sure that these vast amounts of data uh, you know, can be transferred 
when the system you know comes up again and, and have you know possibly have some form of throttling you know i know a lot of these uh a lot of distributed key value stores have exactly that um yeah you know, and help them cope with with you know these surges in data and you know and we've had you know many many interesting uh experiences addressing uh your know, systems where where you know th- these you know use cases hadn't been thought of and just happened afterwards right right and i can uh i can provide two examples so i mean you've already talked about one uh like a nuclear submarine um that has that has its own its own cons- consistency demands that we'd all prefer not to be thinking about exactly right now but um but there's another one called nebo and nebo is a um a system where um, we have this little chunk of hardware that's that's in a closet, and um, it has been up for um, for all every day except three. And every day that it went offline because we didn't have um, that particular device didn't have connectivity, we got a flood of messages saying, "Where are you? <laughs> Did you sink?" And and so yeah, as a consumer, um, I know exactly what you're talking about. There are um, are systems that aren't designed to be um, robust and reliable in this time. And, and Brian's right. Um, maritime sy- systems are ripe to be disrupted. We have we have the technology to solve problems that we're not solving right now. All right, thanks, Aditya. I think we are running out of time, but I just had one last question and maybe we could wrap up. So uh, it's uh, Bruce and Francisco, both to both of you. Uh, you know, in your loop metaphor, you, you touched upon a lot of similarity between functional programming and what uh, Bruce is trying to do with his trip. Uh, there were two things that came to my mind as I was going through. Uh, one was the debugging aspect that typically you know one needs to worry about in programming and the second is testing right so are there parallels that you could highlight uh, that that touches upon these two aspects of programming yeah the big one is that i have to have a regular conversation with my engine um should do it every morning it's probably every two or three mornings with me um but but essentially there's a regular maintenance program and part of the maintenance program, like every 200 hours, I have to check something called the raw water impeller, which means I have to finagle my way into this engine hatch and, and do what we call boat yoga <laughs> to, uh, to kind of reach six different screws, pull those off and check that all of it, that this rubber star has all of its tines on it and that it's, it's still supple. And um, if it's not, then I can't cool my engine and it's going to fail, right? So that's a, um, an example of a test that I need to run on a periodic basis. I also need to check my coolant and my, um, and my oil level every morning because those are systems that can make me fail today. Um, so we do that. And you know, also, there's a, there's a little checklist. We're kind of looking around the engine for, for leaks because if you keep an engine room pretty pretty clean um, problems, the engine will tell on itself, right? Uh, we'll, we'll be able to see um, see individual problems. So this is not a perfect example of a, of a software test because a software test, typically I will run after I make a change. This is a test that I have to make on a regular basis. Uh, so this is more like monitoring of sorts, right? Like for so, the, for so- the- so spot on. So exactly. And, and you know, when I started programming, we had debuggers where you were able to go in and trace your code sequentially. And it was, it was you know, when I started my career at Ericsson, when I first came in contact with uh, concurrent tracing. So we had the process manager, which uh, was part of OTPR1. It was a tool I was working on when I was on the OTPR1 team, which allowed us to start tracing concurrently. And all you need to look you know, look at what's happening now. You know, I mean, look at open telemetry. Look at what's happening in the distributed tracing space. You know, that's all coming in now, and now, and we have tools to help us do that exactly that, making you know, making distributed tracing accessible, you know, to the masses. And it all feeds into um, into um, so the process manager 
has you know now you know turned into the application monitor appmon it, it's turned into a mon basically a large scale monitoring tool where you know it goes beyond you know concurrent tracing you know you're able to monitor memory uh, cpu usage core usage and so on so it, it's you know, as you know as our systems get more and more complex and more and more distributed you know, the tools you know the tool chain which is yeah, you know, the tool chain is evolving around it and is catering for these needs. Absolutely cool. I think that's that's a good thing. So I know we've, we've overshot and I don't want to keep both of you over a weekend uh, hanging in as well. So uh, thanks a lot for doing this uh, and inspiring us to kind of chase uh, whatever dreams or experiments we want to run. So uh, thank you both of you. Uh, hope you uh, reach back safely, Bruce. <laughs> we, yeah, we're hoping that uh, you enjoy the trip, but you're back safe uh, home. Uh, I, I, how how long is it left for for you to finish the trip? Another three months, if I'm not wrong. Oh no no no! Uh, we're going all the way to October. So October. we've been we've been gone for for um, two and a half months, and it's a ten month trip. Ah okay, yeah. cool. Give or take. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you on the boat, Bruce. Let's see Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. We're signing Thanks. off. Right. This is this is the end of the functional conf. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, thanks for making this uh, conference a great experience for everyone. Um, you know, we will have the next edition, as Francis was saying. We will uh, hopefully do that in person next time, and uh, hope to see all of you. Uh, please do, uh, you know. Uh, help with the conference itself, uh, you know, in terms of speakers, in terms of volunteers, in terms of program committee. So as soon as the next conference planning starts, we will let you know and look forward to working with all of you. Uh, again, want to thank all the volunteers, a uh, specific uh, shout out to Natasha and John who have, uh, you know, uh, worked a lot to get this together. Vikram, Jaydeep, other folks uh, on the tech team who've helped build this platform, uh, and all the volunteers who've uh, you know helped moderate the sessions and keep everything going seamlessly. Uh, so thanks everyone again for making this possible, and uh, most importantly, all the attendees from all different countries who some of you who have stayed the whole night up uh, to be part of this conference greatly appreciate that. Hope you don't have to do this next time because we all can be in the same time zone uh, the next time. So with that, signing off uh, and uh, thanks again for a wonderful conference.